Want more cold cases? Sign up for the lineups newsletter to carry eerie's cases delivered straight to your inbox. Who killed Elizabeth Short? The enduring unsolved mystery of the Black Dahlia murder. In 1947, the butchered body of Elizabeth Short was discovered in a vacant lot outside downtown Los Angeles. In the annals of unsolved American crime, few cases cast a spell quite like the Black Dahlia murder. The slaying occurred late on January 14 or in the early morning hours of January 15, 1947. But while decades have passed since newspapers first broke the brutal crime Ellie Curl slain, body slashed in two, body dismembered, left in field, the case remains as mystifying as ever. Part of this infamy can be attributed to The Black Dahlia, the 1987 novel by Norm Master James Elroy, and the 2006 film adaptation of the same name. But the public's continued obsession goes beyond such narrative reimaginings. Professionals and amateurs alike continue to pore over case details in hopes of a break. As recently as a year and a half ago, retired L.A. detective Steve Hodel announced he had cracked the case with evidence that implicated, of all people, his own father. Despite this scrutiny, no one has conclusively fingered the murderer of the Black Dahlia, whose real name was Elizabeth Short. For 21 of her 22 years, Short bounced between Boston and Miami. She only lived in Southern California for the final six months of her life. Yet it's the arid hills of Los Angeles that are most commonly associated with the victim, and it was the dusty basin due south of downtown L.A. where her body was found on January 15, 1947. Betty Berzinger discovered the remains around 10 a.m. in a vacant lot in Limer Park. At first, she thought she had discovered a discarded mannequin. The truth was far more grisly. Short's body had been bisected at the waist. Her intestines were tucked beneath her buttocks, her legs had been spread apart and her elbows bent at right angles in a grotesque pose. Short's face was slit from ear to ear in a maniacal joker face rictus. Her breasts were slashed, her nose broken, vulva mutilated, and her body was drained of blood. Short had been missing since January 9th. Her whereabouts during this missing week remain a mystery and for many, contain the key to her death. What isn't a mystery is the wave of coverage triggered by the murder. Multiple factors pushed the slain to the front page, the grisly state of Short's corpse, her age, her attractiveness, and a sustained media effort to engage in a brand of old-school victim blaming via shaky reporting on Short's sex life. Even the nickname Black Dahlia speaks to the media's two-faced presentation of Short. On the one hand, she was portrayed as a girl lost in the big city, murdered by predators who took advantage of her innocence. In the same breath, many journalists insinuated Short had worked as a call girl. The barely concealed subtext was that a sex worker had been burned in her line of work. Such a death was unfortunate, but perhaps also to be expected. The Los Angeles County District Attorney determined Short had never worked as an escort, but this was only one of the many misconceptions surrounding the case. Witnesses who had supposedly seen Short during her missing week were, one by one, questioned and dismissed by investigators, who determined they were either outright lying or had mistaken Short for another woman. Some sixty people came forward and confessed to the crime. Of these, twenty-five were seriously considered by the LAPD. Many of the suspects were household names, including Fred Sexton, the artist who created the Maltese Falcon prop in the iconic movie of the same name, Norman Chandler, publisher of the Los Angeles Times, Jewish mobster Bugsy Siegel, and the aforementioned George Hodel, a physician who purchased a famous Soden house and, according to Hodel's son, buried bodies in the backyard. And yet, no convictions were ever made. The open-endedness of the Black Dahlia murder stoked the ensuing pop culture bonfire. Any L.A. Noir film or TV show or video game can trace its creative ancestry to Short's murder. The popular game L.A. Noir has an entire level inspired by the killing. In many ways, Elizabeth Short's death is the country's preeminent brand name mystery. Ironically, while the Black Dahlia case remains unsolved, the nittiest of its gritty details are open to the public. If anyone wants to search through the crates of material related to the crime, just head to the FBI vault, where official investigative materials are now public record. 
There you can witness the exhaustive work that went into the investigation. It's a record that, at the very least, puts to rest the myriad rumors that continue to haunt Elizabeth Short long after her tragic end. At least 45 deaths of young men are attributed to the smiley face killer, but most police departments say he doesn't exist. Is there a serial killer stalking college-aged men? The FBI insists no one is drowning inebriated college males and leaving behind a painted smiley face where he dumps the bodies. But no matter how many times officials try to squelch the theory, the rumor of the smiley face killer will not die. And the bodies keep cropping up. The theory originated with two New York City police detectives, Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte. They concluded that the deaths of at least 45 young men by drowning have too many similarities to be unrelated. Although the theory began in connection with bodies found in New York City, it spread to include murder cases from the Midwest. In at least a dozen cases, a painted smiley face was found near a body of water where a victim's corpse was dumped. Nearly all the victims of the supposed smiley face killer were white college men. The detectives speculate the motive may be jealousy, as all the men were good-looking, athletic, and academically successful. Because some of the deaths occurred the same night, but in different states, the NYC detectives altered their theory slightly, believing that the murders were carried out by an organized gang of killers. They believed their theory enough to reportedly use their own personal money to continue the investigation when official funds dried up. The smiley face killer theory all began with the 1997 death of 21-year-old Patrick McNeil. McNeil was last seen drinking with friends in a Manhattan bar. Volunteers plastered the city with thousands of missing flyers. McNeil's body was found two months later and 12 miles away, near the entrance to New York Harbor. Police found no evidence of foul play, but detectives Gannon and Duarte were not convinced. They pledged to keep working on the case. Nearly all of the subsequent deaths have also been ruled accidental drownings involving alcohol. The FBI and several police organizations have researched the deaths and concluded there is no link. The Center for Homicide Research went so far as to publish an exhaustive report called Drowning the Smiley Face Theory. It lists 18 reasons that the theory doesn't hold water, including the fact that smiley faces are a very common form of graffiti and that murder by drowning is extremely rare. But a few criminologists agree with the detectives that there are too many similarities in the deaths to put it down to pure coincidence. And there have been frequent requests to the FBI to pick up the investigation, including one in 2008 from a Wisconsin congressman. The smiley face killer was invoked as recently as 2016 after the drowning death of a 24-year-old in Hoboken. Matthew Genovese had last been seen drinking at a local pub with friends. Like so many of the other supposed murders, Genovese's body showed no signs of foul play. Despite this, many Hoboken residents began to panic about a phantom serial killer possibly living among them. Despite this most recent case, even Gaynan and Duarte have given up on their theory. After spending years, and seemingly a significant chunk of their money, on the smiley face killer theory, the pair stopped researching the case in about 2012. The victims' families and a number of internet sleuths, however, still hold out hope that the smiley face killer theory will prove to be true. It would lend some sense of meaning to the deaths of the many victims whose unexplained drownings still haunt their loved ones. Dorothy Jane Scott disappeared from a parking lot in the middle of the night in 1980. Soon after the disappearance, her family began receiving menacing calls from a mysterious caller. Soon after her disappearance, Dorothy's family began receiving chilling calls from an unidentified caller. When I get you alone, I will cut you up into bits so no one will ever find you, the man's voice said on the phone. It wasn't the first such call that Dorothy Jane Scott had received from the unidentified caller, someone whose voice she seemed to recognize but couldn't quite place, but it was perhaps the most unsettling and, tragically, among the most prophetic. Since early in 1980, Scott, a single mother with a four-year-old son named Sean, had been receiving the threatening calls at her aunt's home in Stanton, California, where she and Sean lived. At times, the caller was fawning, professing his love for Scott and making romantic overtures. 
Otherwise, he was vitriolic and threatening, saying that he was going to harm her in unspeakable ways. In both modes, the caller made it clear that he was watching Scott, recounting details of her day-to-day -day life and, in one instance, telling her to go outside because he had something for her. When she went to her car, she found a single dead rose placed on the windshield. The calls unsettled Scott and her family, but no one was quite sure what to do about them, so they went unreported. Then, on the night of May 28, 1980, Scott dropped her son off with her parents in Anaheim so that she could attend a staff meeting where she worked. During the meeting, she noticed that one of her co-workers, Conrad Bostrin, didn't look well. She offered to take him to the hospital. He took her up on her offer, and another co-worker, Pam Head, accompanied them. On the way, Scott stopped off at her parents' house to check on her son and, while there, switched the black scarf she had been wearing for a red one. At the hospital, it was determined that Bostrin had been bitten by a black widow spider. He was treated while Scott and Head waited around until he was ready to go home. According to Head, Scott never left her side during the evening. When Bostrin was released, Scott went out to the hospital parking lot to get her car while Head and Bostrin waited to fill a prescription. When Scott didn't return right away, her two co-workers walked out to the parking lot. There they saw Scott's car speeding away, the headlights blinding them so that they couldn't see who was behind the wheel. Initially, Bostrin and Head assumed that some emergency had come up involving Scott's son, but when they still hadn't heard from her a few hours later, they reported her missing. At around 4.30 the following morning, Scott's car, a white Toyota station wagon, was found in an alley in Santa Ana, about 10 miles from the hospital. The car had been set ablaze, but no one was inside. It was only about a week later that Scott's mother, Farah, received the first call. Are you related to Dorothy Scott? The voice on the phone asked. When Farah said that she was, the caller simply added, I've got her, and then hung up. It was the first such call that Scott's parents received, but it wouldn't be the last. Though police installed a voice recorder at their residence, they were never able to trace the calls, as the caller never stayed on the line for more than a short time. Shortly after the mysterious calls began, Scott's father approached the Santa Ana Register asking them to run a story about his missing daughter. The story ran on June 12, 1980, and that same day Pat Riley, the paper's editor, received an anonymous phone call from someone claiming to be Dorothy Scott's killer. She was my love, the caller said. I caught her cheating with another man. She denied having someone else. I killed her. The caller provided details that hadn't been included in the newspaper story, such as the color of Scott's scarf and the fact that her co-worker had been treated for a black widow bite that evening. The caller also claimed that Scott had called him that night from the hospital, though Pam had insisted that Scott had never left her side that evening. As far as anyone in her life was aware, Dorothy Scott had no serious boyfriend at the time of her death. Still, police believed that the man who called the Santa Ana Register was probably her killer. During all of this time, Scott was still missing. It was nearly two months later, on August 6, 1984, that construction workers would discover charred bones near Santa Ana Canyon Road. The bones included human and dog remains side by side. Authorities believed that they had been there for some time, as a brush fire had swept through the area in 1982 and likely explained the charred condition of the bones. Though no cause of death was able to be established, a turquoise ring and watch were both found with the remains, and the bones were identified as Scott's through dental records. Though the strange phone calls to Scott's family stopped in April of 1984, they resumed after Scott's remains were found in August. In spite of the killer's taunting calls, however, Scott's murder remains unsolved to this day. On December 6, 1991, Austin, Texas was shell-shocked by a vicious crime. Firefighters responded to reports of smoke rising from a yogurt shop on West Anderson Lane. Once inside, the responders found the brutalized bodies of four teenage girls, Amy Ayers, Jennifer Harbison, Sarah Harbison, and Eliza Thomas. It was a murder scene that could appall the most hardened homicide detective. In the early 1990s, Austin, Texas was shell-shocked by a tragic, vicious crime. 
Late on December 6, 1991, firefighters responded to reports of smoke rising from the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt shop on West Anderson Lane. Once inside, the responders found a scene of unmitigated horror. Amidst the inferno were the brutalized bodies of four teenage girls, Amy Ayers, Jennifer Harbison, Sarah Harbison, and Eliza Thomas. At least one of the girls had been raped. Three were stacked atop each other like cordwood, and all had been bound with their own clothing before being shot in the head with a .22 caliber handgun. It was a murder that could appall even the most hardened homicide detective. Immediately, the public placed pressure on authorities to catch whoever was responsible. For suspects, all teenagers themselves at the time were charged with the crime eight years later, Forrest Wellborn, Maurice Pierce, Robert Springsteen, and Michael Scott. Grand juries, citing a lack of evidence, declined to indict Wellborn. The charges against Pierce were later dropped. Scott and Springsteen, however, were convicted in late 1999. The pair had confessed to the crime, saying that they committed the rape and murders while the other two stood watch. Scott was sentenced to life imprisonment. Springsteen, however, went to one of the best-known and most feared places in Texas, Death Row. Before long, cracks began appearing in the case against them. They centered on the fact that their confessions, which they alleged had been coerced, were very detailed. Too detailed for some people's liking. One of the yogurt shop case's investigators, Detective Hector Polanco, was transferred off the case after allegations of his extorting similarly detailed confessions in an unrelated case. It didn't help the Austin PD when a photograph surfaced on the internet from video footage of Scott's questioning. The image came from the Austin PD's own camera and it showed Detective Merrill aiming a gun at Scott's head. By this point, the defendants had been sentenced to life and spent almost a decade in prison. The confession provided were, according to one report, stunningly detailed but decidedly false. The allegations against Polanco contributed to having Springsteen's and Scott's cases reviewed and their convictions eventually overturned. There were a number of factors making investigations especially difficult. The Austin Police Department were relatively inexperienced in handling such horrific cases and the public pressures that went with them. They also faced a plethora of false confessions useless information, and leads that went nowhere but still had to be checked. At one point, the investigation had a list of 342 potential perpetrators. All told, over 50 false confessions had to be debunked, including one from serial killer Kenneth McDuff. McDuff, executed in 1998 on unrelated murder convictions, made a confession on his execution day. He was known to be active in the area at the time of the crime and to target teenagers. Even though his confession was most likely an effort to gain a stay of execution, it still had to be checked. If, however, Macduff was hoping for a stay, he was disappointed. He died as scheduled. It wasn't until 2006 that the convictions of Scott and Springsteen were overturned. Because the state appealed against the ruling, the pair weren't released until 2009 to 10 years after they were sent to jail. Forrest Wellborn, alleged by the state to have been a lookout all Springsteen, Pierce, and Scott committed the crime, remains scarred by his experience at the hands of the Austin PD. Fellow suspect Maurice Pierce died in December 2010 when a routine traffic stop turned deadly. Soon after being pulled over by Officer Frank Wilson and Wilson's partner, Pierce fled the scene. Caught by Wilson, Pierce drew a knife and stabbed the officer in the neck. Wilson managed to draw his sidearm and fatally shot Pierce. Wilson ultimately survived the stabbing. Other evidence still remains unresolved. Two unidentified men were seen entering the shop shortly before the time of the crime. According to two other customers, both credible witnesses who stopped in for yogurt Sundays, these men arrived shortly before the shop closed and remained after the door had been locked and the shop closed. It was common practice to close up around 10 minutes before 11 p.m., unlocking the door to allow any late customers to leave. Cold case detectives currently reviewing the case have yet to identify either of the men. DNA samples discovered at the scene match neither Scott nor Springsteen. Were the two unidentified subjects involved or just casual customers passing through? 
Unless they are found, the residents of Austin will likely never know just what happened in the yogurt shop that night in 1991. The Dardine family met a chilling end in their small town of Ina, Illinois in 1987. More than a decade later, a serial killer sitting on death row in Texas claimed he committed the crimes. Yet the truth of the Dardine's final moments remain as uncertain today as it was on the evening of November 18, 1987, when police first discovered their brutalized bodies. The crime was considered too brutal and gruesome to be reported on daytime TV. The Dardine family met a truly disturbing end in their small town of Ina, Illinois in 1987. More than a decade later, a serial killer sitting on death row in Texas would claim he committed the crimes, along with more than 70 other slayings. Yet the truth of the Dardine's final moments remains as uncertain today as it was on the evening of November 18, 1987 when police first discovered their brutalized bodies. The police visited the trailer because Russell Keith Dardine, then 29 years old, hadn't shown up for his job as a water treatment plant operator at the nearby Ren Lake Water Conservancy District. Reportedly, Keith, he preferred to go by his middle name, was an extremely reliable worker. When he neither appeared for work nor called in to report his absence, his supervisor placed calls to both of Keith's parents, who said that they hadn't seen him. By evening, the police went to the Dardine family home to investigate, where they met Don Dardine, Keith's father, who had brought Keith to the trailer. What they found inside was a crime scene so violent and gruesome that it would haunt everyone involved for years to come. Elaine Dardine and her three-year-old son Peter had been beaten to death with a baseball bat that had been a birthday present to Peter from his father earlier that year. To make matters worse, Elaine had been pregnant with the couple's second child, a daughter, and the beating caused her to go into labor. The killer or killers had shown no mercy, however, and the newborn child was beaten to death as well. Elaine was bound with duct tape and gagged, and all three were tucked into bed together. The area had even been cleaned up, indicating that the killer or killers had been in no hurry to vacate the crime scene. The initial suspicions that Keith Dardine had brutally murdered his own family were quickly laid to rest when his body was found the following day, lying in a nearby field. He had been shot three times, and his penis was cut off. Police found Keith's car parked outside the police station in the nearby town of Benton, some 11 miles from the Dardine home. Blood on the interior indicated that it was the likely site of Keith Dardine's murder. Such a brutal crime would have been enough to shock a rural community, but the fact was that the Dardines were not the first victims in the area. Over the past two years, Jefferson County had been home to 15 homicides, including one particularly grim case in which a teenager living in Mount Vernon killed his parents and three siblings. While the spate of murders seemed unrelated, it was enough to drive locals into an intense state of fear. During the days and weeks following the discovery of the Dardine family murders, locals took to openly carrying shotguns and the coroner in nearby Franklin County was quoted as saying that locals were so afraid to let strangers into their homes that if he ran out of gas on a country road, he wouldn't even bother knocking on the door and would instead simply walk to the highway and hitch a ride. In spite of a massive investigation involving 30 detectives dedicating full-time work to the case and interviewing more than 100 people, the police were not able to determine a motive for the killings, let alone find a likely suspect. As time passed and the case grew colder and colder, Joanne Dardine, Keith's mother, continued to pressure authorities to try to solve the murders of her son and his family. She gathered more than 3,000 signatures in an attempt to get the Oprah Winfrey show to do a segment on the murders, which were deemed too graphic for daytime television. Similarly, America's Most Wanted also initially passed on the case, though they later did a segment in 1998 that produced no new leads. It wasn't until the year 2000 that new light was thrown upon the brutal slaying of the Dardine family. That year, a serial killer named Tommy Lynn Sells, who had been arrested after cutting the throats of two girls near Del Rio, Texas, began confessing to other murders that he claimed he had committed over the years while riding the rails and working at traveling carnivals. One of the killings that Sells claimed responsibility for was the murder of the Dardine family. According to Sells, he met Keith at a truck stop, or maybe a pool hall, and Keith invited him home to dinner, where Keith then propositioned Sells to engage in a threesome with him and Elaine. Or maybe not. 
Maybe Sells just saw the for sale sign on the Dardeen's trailer and, with it, an opportunity. Part of the problem with the confession of Tommy Lynn Sells is that he didn't always stick to his own story, let alone the particulars of the case. When Sells first confessed in 2000, Joanne Dardeen was convinced of his guilt. As the years went by, however, her conviction waned, and by the time Sells was executed in 2014, her doubts were significant. Tommy deserved to die for what he did, but I wanted him to stay alive until I know, sick, positively he didn't do it, she told the Associated Press shortly after his execution. Though Sells confessed to more than 70 murders, at the time of his execution, authorities were only convinced of his guilt in 22 of his supposed killings. The brutal slaying of the Dardeen family wasn't one of them, and to this day the chilling Illinois murder case officially remain unsolved.